All right, good afternoon and uh, welcome again to the Communication and Signal Processing Seminar. Um, today, um, we have Shivat, Shivateja Magluri from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, before I introduce him, I should um, first thank our, our, the people behind the scenes, uh, is, uh, Shadi Talkant and Catherine Gordon, who helped uh, run the show. And also the uh, areas, research areas that help uh, set up the seminar. So uh, Shiva is currently a uh, Ford's family early career professor and assistant professor in the uh, H. Milton Stewart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. Before that, he was a research staff member uh, in the Mathematical Sciences Department, IBM PJ Watson Research Center. He obtained his PhD in uh, MS and ECE as well as an MS in um, Applied Math from Urbana-Champaign and a, a BTEC from Electrical Engineering from IIT Madras. And, uh, his research interests span the areas of control, optimization, algorithms, and applied probability. In particular, he's interested in reinforcement learning theory, which he's going to talk about today, uh, scheduling, resource allocation, and revenue optimization problems that arise in a variety of systems, including data centers, cloud computing, wireless networks, blockchains, and ride hailing systems. Now he's a recipient of multiple awards, including the Biennial uh, Best Publication in Applied Probability Award in 2017 for his uh, work on uh, heavy traffic optimality of max weight and EMA switch. Uh, second place awarded INFORM's JFIG Best Paper Competition in 2020, CTL BP uh, Junior Faculty Teaching Excellence Award in 2020, and the Student Recognition of Excellence in Teaching Class of 1934 CIOS Award in 2020. So with this, I cede the floor to Siva. Please go on. Vijay, thanks a lot for inviting me to give this talk, and also thanks a lot for the generous introduction. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, final finite sample guarantees of reinforcement learning algorithms uh, from a stochastic approximation on the Yapno perspective. And uh, this is joint work with uh, my student Zaiwei Chen, who is the first author on two papers that I'm going to talk about. So um, as we go through the talk, I'll pause in between for any quick questions. If you have any easy questions, you can ask me when I pause. If you have any hard questions, Ask them on the chat and Zaiwe will answer. So, and uh, this also joint work with uh, Sanjay Shekotai from Austin and Karthik Shenmugan from IBM Research. Okay, so reinforcement learning needs no introduction these days. A uh, few years ago with the spectacular success of AlphaGo, reinforcement learning kind of came into forefront. And since then reinforcement learning has been used to success successfully attack uh, a variety of problems, including uh, very recently AlphaFold, uh, which is also from DeepMind, uh, where they solved the 50 year long open problem on uh, protein folding. and. Uh, uh, DeepMind also has a project called Street Learn, where uh, they design a system which learns how to navigate within a city without using GPS, just by using pictures. And uh, OpenAI built a robotic arm that uh, figures out how to not only handle and move around and rotate a Rubik's Cube with just a single hand, and also actually solve it. So. Um, uh, all these successes are possible because of the uh, versatile nature of a reinforcement learning setup. So in reinforcement learning, there's an agent and there's an environment and the environment can be in a state and the agent can take an action at each time. So there's a dynamic uh, setup. And every time the agent takes an action, two things happen. First thing is that the environment moves from one state to a different state, probabilistically, depending on the action that the agent took. And secondly, the agent gets a reward. And the goal for the agent is simply to take a sequence of actions in order to maximize long-term rewards. And typically the agent does this by coming up with a policy. A policy is just a rule which tells it, if I'm in certain state, I should take certain action. And this action that one takes in a given state can be either deterministic or randomized. And uh, the goal for the agent is to find a policy that maximizes the long-term rewards. And um, um, 
this is usually modeled as uh, what is called as a Markov decision process and the MDP formalism is like almost a century old. And it's a very versatile uh, setup that enables one to study any dynamic uh, system and uh, any system where you, it's not a one shot thing like in supervised or unsupervised learning. It's a thing where you take a sequence of actions. And the MDPs are like ubiquitous in engineering, pretty much uh, any engineering discipline uses uh, 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 MDPs to solve their problems. In reinforce, the only difference between MDPs and reinforcement learning is that the transition probabilities are unknown. Uh, so when an agent takes an action, what is the distribution of future state uh, that is unknown in uh, reinforcement learning? And these transition probabilities and the reward probabilities are usually called model. So the model is unknown. So to go ahead about uh, talking about um, uh, finding the optimal policy in reinforcement learning, uh, a key notion that is very important is what is called as the value function. And uh, the value function for any given state is simply defined as follows. I start in the state and at every time, this is policy pi that is given to me, at every time I take an action following this policy pi, and then I look at my long-term reward. So I go from time zero equal to zero to infinity. If I add up all my rewards, I'll go to infinity. So I do a discounted uh, sum of all the rewards and expected long-term discounted rewards is called the value function. Uh, this is not new. I think value functions are used in MDP world uh, since like decades. Uh, in reinforcement learning, on the other hand, people define a new value function, which is called the state action value function, which is very similar to the V function. This is typically called the Q function. But um, uh, what we do is at time zero, I, I'm in state S. At time zero, I take action A. I don't follow the policy. I just take action A. But at all future times, I take, uh, uh, I take an action following the policy. And then again, I look at the long-term reward. And then this is called the Q function. This depends on my initial state and action. So, so this, this lives in a larger dimensional space because uh, it's a function of both S and A. And in this talk, I will uh, uh, focus on um, uh, finite state, uh, finite state, and action spaces, and obviously the discounted uh, cost problem. So the goal, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is to find the optimal policy, the policy that maximizes the value function, uh, and this is usually called the control problem. Even though this is the big goal, many times people look at a smaller goal, which is called the policy evaluation problem. Here, I don't care about the optimal policy. Someone gave me a policy pi, and then all I have to do is find the corresponding value function. Why do we care about this uh, policy evaluation? Because it serves as a uh, subroutine to in some approaches to find uh, to solve the control problem. Okay, then um, let's actually think about how to solve the simpler problem, the policy evaluation problem. So I told you that the value function is simply this expectation of this long-term discounted rewards. Then uh, I want to evaluate this value function. So I can think of a very simple approach, so which is called the Monte Carlo approach. All I do is I start in status, and then I follow the policy. I take a bunch of actions, and then I keep going. I take uh, an infinite long trajectory, and then I generate multiple such trajectories, and then I calculate the long-term discounted reward on each trajectory, and then just average them. Then by law of large numbers, we know that uh, instead of this expectation, I'm just doing a sample average. So this should work. So this is called Monte Carlo approach. Obviously, I made it look uh, ridiculous because I'm not going to run uh, infinite long trajectories. Um, uh, I can truncate it at some point because this is anyway being discounted. And then I can possibly even reuse samples in a single trajectory instead of doing multiple independent trajectories. I can do many things to actually make this more efficient, but I'll not worry too much about it. Um, I'll just think of this Monte Carlo conceptually as simply using law of large numbers to uh, evaluate this expectation. Then a question I can ask is, is this Monte Carlo approach good? Is there any other better approach? Can I, uh, is there a better approach? Is there a different approach which I can actually prove to be strictly better than Monte Carlo? So this is one question we're going to focus on. And um, uh, the answer to this is actually quite uh, well known uh, that uh, using bootstrapping or what is called a stochastic approximation usually performs better than Monte Carlo. But uh, this is not proved. So one of the contributions of the current work is that we prove that uh, bootstrapping is better than Monte Carlo. I'll explain what all this means as we as we go along. So so in order to do something more than just simply calculating this expectation by uh, an average, I need to exploit something about the problem structure, something about the MDP. And to do this, the key uh, result that we're going to use is something called the Bellman equation. So. 
if I, I want to find the value function, remember the value function, the reason I call it a function is for every S I have a different number. So if I collect all the values, it's it's like a vector. So since I'm in finite dimensional space, function and vector mean the same thing for me. So in this talk, function and vector are interchangeable. So I have this value function or the value vector. Uh, so the Bellman equation says that it satisfies the following fixed point equation. Uh, if you have done a course on MDPs, you know why this is the case. I'm not going to explain that, but the only thing I'm trying to, uh, I want to point out is that on the left hand side, this is true for all S, which means I have S different equations. Uh, so if I stack all these value functions into uh, values into a vector, I get this bold V pi. So on the left hand side, I, v, I have V pi. On the right hand side, I have V pi. So this whole thing on the right hand side is some complicated operator, which takes V pi and spits out something else. I'm calling it H of V pi. And then I want to solve this fixed point equation. In this case, this, uh, this operator is actually a linear operator because the expectation is linear. And then I'm just uh, doing multiplication by constant and some uh, under sum. Uh, so if I solve this fixed point equation, I get the value function. So this is well known from MDP theory. But the only problem is that if I know this operator, I can somehow solve this fixed point equation. And But this operator has an expectation sitting inside it. Remember in reinforcement learning, I don't know the model. So I cannot find this expectation. I cannot mathematically evaluate this expectation. That's a problem. Okay, so I told you that there is V function, this Q function. So for a given policy pi, I can similarly write a fixed point equation for the Q pi. I'm not showing it here. And then uh, I said that I want to find the optimal policy, right? Then I can ask you about the, uh, the value function, the V function or the Q function for the optimal policy. Here I'm talking about the Q function for the optimal policy. I'm denoting it by Q star. And it is well known that this guy also satisfies a fixed point equation, which looks very similar to the previous fixed point equation. The main difference between being that there is a max sitting inside. So this is a nonlinear operator that makes a big difference, but still this is some operator. So this is another fixed point equation of the form Q star equal to H of Q star. Um, I mentioned that in reinforcement learning, we use uh, Q function, whereas in MDPs, we don't talk about Q functions. The reason is the following. So why do I care about this Q star? Because in control problem, my goal is to find the optimal policy, right? Here, I'm talking about the value function corresponding to the optimal policy. So it turns out that if I know Q star, and then for every state, if I just find the action that maximizes it, I, I do arg max here, that will actually give me the optimal policy. So which means once I know Q star, I, by just doing arg max, I know the optimal policy. Uh, with V star, you cannot do this in the setting where you don't know the model. That's the reason in reinforcement learning, we use Q function as opposed to the V function. Okay, so at the end of the day, the takeaway message is that I have to solve this fixed point equation when I don't really know this H. That's the, that's the takeaway. If I solve this fixed point equation, I'll solve the policy evaluation problem. If I solve the second fixed point equation, I solve the control problem. So what we are going uh, what we are going to do next is um, talk about stochastic approximation, which is a method to solve fixed point equations when I don't know the operator but I have access to noisy uh, samples. So I'll present the stochastic approximation model that we are going to talk about. I'll motivate it based on the control problem, and I'll present a very very general result that gives us finite sample bounds for a broad class of stochastic approximation algorithms. That is the first part of the talk. Then in the second part of the talk, I will illustrate how to use this uh, uh, general result to get finite sample bounds for reinforcement learning algorithms. In particular, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about Q-learning. I'll give you finite sample bounds for Q-learning, which is a very popular uh, way to solve the control problem. Then I'll focus on the policy evaluation problem. And then I'll talk about TD learning is a popular approach to solve the policy evaluation problem. And there are many variants of TD, TD learning. There is something called in-step TD learning. I'll talk about that. And there is something called TD Lambda. And while talking about both of these, I'll try to answer the question I posed at the very beginning, if you can do anything better than Monte Carlo. And finally, uh, there is an off policy variant of TD called VTrace. So, uh, even though I have slides prepared for all these four, I don't. I believe that I'll not have time to get to all of this. I'll pr I'll try to present at least two different reinforcement learning results, and um, I'll try to talk about the proof sketch at a uh, at a very very high level. And if time permits, I'll uh, briefly cover uh, other reinforcement learning work that happens in my research group. So before I go ahead, I'll take a quick pause to check if there are any questions. Okay, if there are no questions, let's start with stochastic approximation. 
So remember, I want to solve a fixed point equation. There's an operator H that's given to me. I want to find an equation that solves this. Why am I interested in this? Because I want to solve the Bellman equation, obviously, right? There's another example, which is very popular, where suppose my operator H happens to be of this form. It is X minus uh, some constant times gradient of F of X. F is some function. Then solving this fixed point equation is just same as solving gradient of F equal to zero. And if the function happens to be convex, then that solution is uh, the minimum of f. So optimization can be thought of as, uh, can be posed as uh, solving fixed point. So stochastic approximation can be used to solve optimization problems. And in fact, uh, such algorithms are called stochastic gradient descent, which are very popular in um, machine learning. So a simple way of doing it is I start with some x0, and then I keep recursively applying this h, xk plus one equal to h of xk. Okay, fine, does this work? So there is uh, this popular result that uh, called Banach fixed point theorem, which says that this actually works if H satisfies something called as a contraction property. What is contraction property? All it says is that if there are two, vector, uh, two vectors X and Y, uh, uh, I'm assuming X is a vector in D-dimensional space because I uh, am living, I work with finite dimensional objects. Uh, so if I have two vectors and I apply H operator to them, I'll get new vectors and the distance between the new vectors is smaller than the distance between the original vectors. And I can pretty much use any uh, notion of distance, any norm uh, in d-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, so as long as H is a contraction, this uh, it is known that there's a unique fixed point uh, uh, for H and uh, this iteration converges to that geometrically fast. In optimization terminology, it's also called linearly fast. Now the problem is I don't know this H. Suppose I have an access to a noisy oracle. I give it X, it gives me H of X plus noise. Now, does this work? Uh, so if I, if I, instead of using H, I, I can't do H of X, so I can only do H, plus, H of X plus noise. Then does this iteration work? And uh, the answer is kind of yes. So in 1951, Robinson Monroe proposed what is called a stochastic approximation. The main idea there is that in the simple iteration, I'm going from XK to H of X plus noise, right? What they say is that don't go all the way there. Do a convex combination between the current iterate X and the H of X plus noise. Uh, why? Because, because of this noise, I don't trust uh, this no uh, noisy Oracle response too much. If I'm, uh, if I'm kind of close to optimal uh, or to the solution or something, I don't want to go too far away and then get noise, uh, 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 let noise uh, mess up the whole thing. So I don't trust it so, too much. So I do a linear combination. In fact, what is this linear combination? This is usually called the step size or the, or the learning rate. And uh, in reality, I can make it diminish with, with time as time goes to zero. Because as time goes to zero, if I'm working, making progress and I'm kind of close to X star, I don't want this noise to affect me too much. So, so I can make it go down or I can use a constant. We'll talk about all the cases. And the same thing can be written in this uh, form. And instead of H of X minus X, if I have minus gradient of F, uh, F of X, this is the famous stochastic gradient descent. Okay, and typically this noise is I, uh, assumed to be either ID or Martingale difference typically means zero, and then variance is bounded in some manner. I'll not get into, the, I'll not worry about the details. So Shiva, a quick question there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there is a there is another stream of work which says, okay, now uh, if if I have lots of samples, right? The fact that the h, I mean, this can be written as some h uh, h n, right? So sort of mm -hmm. uh, so noisy operator. Mm -hmm. And uh, that operator with high probability will be a contraction. Yeah. So what you're so saying is, I if can get uh, multiple IID samples from this oracle. Then this well, or be... some form. I've con I mean, whatever a noisy or oracle is, there is some variance. Whatnot. So I've, I've basically uh, constructed an operator H n, which, and the n sort of controls how good it is, how good an uh, how good it approximates H. Right. Right. Then I basically just run with that random operator. I Correct. iterated multiple times. Correct. And uh, there are results to say that basically when is that random operator almost a contraction or is it contraction with high probability? Correct. So you can Correct. still get a sense of how good you're doing uh, in those. So um, I think in, even in optimization literature, there is a lot of work on that. This is called stochastic approximation. That is called sample average approximation. And uh, 
I think the usual, the result says that sample average approximation and stochastic approximation have more or less the same complexity. But uh, what I'll show in the next few slides is that I need more than this. A general Oracle model of this is of this kind is not enough for certain reinforcement learning applications. I need to be able to sample along a trajectory. For that, I need to exploit more structure. And that's why I'm actually going to modify this stochastic approximation as well. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. So what I'm going to do next is let's actually go to Q, uh, uh, let's actually go back to the control problem. So recall that I had a Bellman equation for the control problem. I call this Q star equal to H of Q star. The problem is this H has an expectation sitting inside it. I don't know how to evaluate it because I don't know the transition probabilities. So this is what I already told you. Now that we learned the stochastic approximation method, using stochastic approximation to solve this looks exactly like this. I took the equation from previous slide, removed X, put Q, that's all. If I use it in this case, what happens is, so QK, QK plus one equal to QK plus epsilon K, and this minus QK is just this, then this H of QK plus noise is simply whatever is in here without the expectation. Basically, I quietly dropped the expectation. Why did I do that? Because I don't know how to evaluate it. If I drop the expectation, it's as if I'm adding some noise, and that noise by definition is being zero. So by dropping the expectation, I am essentially doing a stochastic approximation. Okay, this is the simple way of using stochastic approximation. Okay, let's think about how this works. So what this is saying is I have to update this whole vector at every time, which means for every S comma A, I have to update this in every time. So if I think about it uh, in terms of sampling, what I have to do is I have some reinforcement learning problem. I have some robot. I have to do one, if I want to do one iteration of the stochastic approximation, I have to start from state, Z, state one, take action one, it'll go somewhere. I should bring it back to state one, take action two, it'll go somewhere else, bring it back to state one, take every possible action, then go to state two, take every possible action and so on. Then I can update all the components of this vector at every time. This is ridiculous, right? I mean, I can't reset a robot in every time. If I'm talking about Atari games, I can do it because it's a video game. I can reset, I can do whatever I want. But in a real world, that's not possible. If I want to collect data, I usually the robot starts in some place. It takes an action, it goes somewhere, it takes another action, it goes somewhere and so on. So you'll have a trajectory and I want to collect data along a trajectory. So this approach is called synchronous reinforcement learning, synchronous algorithms. And uh, usually they're not practical, but uh, they're analyzed because they're easier to study uh, um, uh, mathematically. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you an asynchronous uh, uh, update corresponding to this. So this is exactly the same equation from the previous slide. So I don't like this because I have to reset in every time. Instead, what I'll do is, instead of updating every component in every time, I'll update a single component. So I start my robot in an initial state. I take an action, it goes to some other state. I take another action, it goes to some other state and so on. At each time, I'll update only the single component that corresponds to the current state and action. Among all the components, I update only one component. This is called asynchronous stochastic approximation. So this algorithm that I just described is called Q-learning. What is Q-learning? So first I fix a, uh, I start with this uh, fixed policy pi. This can be any nice enough policy. It need not be optimal policy. Then I use it to collect data. At every time I take an action according to this policy pi. And then I update my Q vector asynchronously, a single component in every time according to this equation. This is called Q-learning. We're going to show that this actually converges to Q star. Uh, so if I want to go back to the stochastic approximation language, now I have to change my stochastic approximation. I'll have QK plus one equal to QK plus step size. I leave my WK as is minus QK, but instead of H of QK here, I put some function of QK and YK. What is YK? YK is some general Markov chain. In this case, this YK corresponds to the state of my robot, the current state. So this YK will give me uh, one value each time, which tells me the current state and action. In general, this is uh, this can be used to model any Markov chain. I can I'm allowed I can update multiple state action pairs in every time, or I can update uh, I can make an update in some complicated way de depending on a Markov chain. The bottom line is I have a stochastic approximation that looks like this, which depends on a Markov chain implicitly. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this stochastic approximation. I call this the Markovian stochastic approximation. It's also called asynchronous stochastic approximation. And um, um, I claim that this can be used to solve a fixed point equation of this form. 
uh, f bar of x equal to x. What is f bar? f bar is expectation of this f of x comma y, where y comes from its stationary distribution. Y, remember, is a Markov chain. So look at the stationary distribution of the y Markov chain and then take expectation with it. Then y goes away. Then you'll have a function of x. I'm calling that f bar of x. So f bar of x equal to x. You can think of this f bar as same as h for, for the time being. The subtle differences between h and f bar, for the time being, you can just think of it as same as h in the context of reinforcement learning. Uh, any questions so far on the stochastic approximation model? Yeah, I have a quick question, Siva. Yeah. So uh, do you have any assumption on w and f? Like any uh, general yes. f and On f, we have certain assumptions about Lipschitzness and some boundedness. On W, uh, I'm going to show the assumption on W, mean zero, and then uh, a finely bounded by X. Okay, but W and uh, Y can be correlated. They don't need to be- W and Y can be correlated. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Because okay. it's just Martingale difference. Martingale difference can depend on all of the history actually. Right, yeah, okay. So, uh, I had a question, Shiva. I mean, yeah. uh, do you need the Y marker chain to be, um, uh, something that is exogenous and time homogeneous, or can you allow that to actually be? So, if you take something like a two time scale stochastic approach, no, I think two time scale is much more harder. We don't do two time scale in this work. I have another work where I do two time scale analysis, but that is a different setup. Here, Y has to be homogeneous. Okay. So, in fact, these are the main assumptions. I didn't talk about the assumption on F that Leah asked about, but I pointed out the main ones that I need for the rest of the talk. The first thing is that this F bar, I told you that you should think of F bar as H, right? So this F bar is a contraction operator. The key thing, one of the key contributions of our work is that this contraction can be with respect to any norm. If this contraction happened to be two norm, analyzing this is relatively easier. But if it is infinity norm, it's the hardest among all norms, so to say. And uh, the operator that comes from the Bellman equation for the control problem actually is a contraction with respect to infinity norm. And it is not a contraction with respect to two norm. That's the reason we had to develop this, uh, this uh, whole framework. And secondly, as Vijay asked, this YK is assumed to be a Markov chain. Uh, we assume it's ergodic. It has a unique stationary distribution. And it is geometrically mixing. Uh, um, uh, YK need not be in finite state space, actually. It can be arbitrary countable state space. But if YK happen to be finite state space, we get geometric mixing for free. And the geometric part is not important. All, as long as we have like reasonably fast mixing time, that's, that's good enough. And this WK is uh, uh, either IID or Martingale difference, mean zero, and it's bounded uh, in an affine manner in terms of X. Okay, so with these assumptions, let me state the main result. So I told you, so this is a stochastic approximation I talked, I showed you before. The main thing is in this slide, I'm focusing on the fixed step size. I'll talk about diminishing step sizes in the next slide. Uh, and then um, I have an arbitrary norm. And then uh, uh, this F bar is a contraction with contraction factor gamma. So our bound is uh, that this epsilon should, this a condition on epsilon should be small enough. Then the mean square error, X star remember is the fixed point of this uh, F bar. And uh, the mean square error of xk uh, between xk and x star in the same norm is bounded by two terms. The first term uh, uh, decays geometrically fast. This is something less than one. Forget about the log one over epsilon for the timing. Just think of it as k. Then this is geometrically decaying uh, with time. So this term goes to zero very, very quickly. Very similar to the Barnard fixed point here. Then the second term is a constant. It does not, there is no k here. And this constant depends on epsilon. It's basically proportional to epsilon with this log term. So what this is saying is that my error initially decays geometrically fast, but after some point, once it is kind of close enough to X star, it doesn't make any progress. It's kind of just wandering around. And uh, the radius of this ball is proportional to epsilon with an additional log factor. And this uh, C1, I've hidden a lot of details in C1, C2, C3. I'm not going to show those expressions because they look complicated. I just want to highlight the main things within those uh, constants. C1 has the initial condition. In some sense, if the initial condition, if I start with X star, then this term will go away in some sense. And um, uh, then I told you that these results are applicable for any norm. And the infinity norm is by far the hardest. So in order to explain the C2 and C3 more clearly, I'll focus on the infinity norm. We have results for all norms, but I just want to highlight certain terms in the case of infinity norm contractions. Then this C2 happens to be one minus gamma over two. This is the, this is the discount factor we have here. 
So the discount factor, uh, sorry, the contraction factor, the contraction factor shows up in the, in the geometric rate of convergence. And the C3 has a logarithmic dependence in di dimension. This XK is a d-dimensional vector. So the dimensionality, dimensionality shows up here logarithmically. And um, it can be argued that this log cannot be improved as long as you have infinity norm contraction. Uh, any questions on this result? Okay, so the log factors appear because of this Markov chain, because geometrically mixing, we have these log factors. Instead, if this YK was IAD, then this log will disappear. So the log show because of geometric mixing. Okay, good. So this is kind of good because I'm kind of going to X star, but it's not good enough because I'm not converging to X star. I'll only get close to X star, but uh, I'll not get close enough. Uh, I'll not get arbitrarily close to it. Then this suggests, a, uh, this suggests an approach because this residual error is proportional to epsilon. What I can do is I'll start with some step size. I'll very quickly make progress. And after some time, I'll stop make, making progress. Then at that time, I can half my step size. Then very quickly, I'll go to a half ball. Then once I enter that ball, I can further half my steps. And by doing this, I can go to X star. So in fact, there are some uh, uh, algorithms which uh, develop on this heuristic. The main challenge there is you have to figure out when you enter the ball. That is a non-trivial task. Uh, instead, what we'll do is we'll just uh, come up with a schedule, a diminishing step size, a schedule of the learning rate. And that's what we present in the next, uh, next slide. So everything is same, except that now the step sizes are diminishing. In particular, I assume that the step sizes are of this form. One over k power psi, the psi is between zero and one. Uh, um, if psi equal to zero, it's constant step size. I, we already talked about it in the previous time, the previous slide. Uh, if psi is strictly between zero and one, we show that actually um, we had, in the previous slide, we had two terms, two error terms, right? I like to call the first one bias and the second one variance because the first one, is the error because of starting in a wrong state. And it is going to zero geometrically fast. The second one is the residual error. So I like to think of them as bias and variance. So in the, in the diminishing step size case in this slide, I'm only going to talk about the dominant term, which is typically the variance. In the paper, we have both terms explicitly written down, but for simplicity, I'm just focusing on the dominant uh, thing. So the first thing to notice here is that if I use diminishing step sizes of this form, think of psi equal to half. Then, I'm th then my step size is like one over square root of k then this error is going to zero. That's a good news. But the bad news is that its uh, rate is one over square root of k. It's pretty bad with an additional log factor. Uh, in fact, what actually happens is the bias is going to zero uh, like uh, super polynomially, but sub-exponentially. But the variance is actually of this form and variance is the dominant term. Okay, if you look at this, then the thing is, if I want to have the best possible rate, I have to pick psi as large as possible. Then the question is what happens if psi equal to one? And uh, uh, it is actually known that psi should not be less than, uh, greater than one for other reasons. Uh, so if psi equal to one, turns out it is slightly more complicated. So this numerator constant is almost irrelevant for the rate if psi is less than one. But in the case of psi equal to one, this numerator constant plays a very significant role. If the, if the numerator alpha is large enough, then I get the rate that I expect, log k over k. But if I accidentally pick a small alpha, then my rate is worse than uh, what I had in the first case. Okay, b b uh, but the bottom line is if I pick psi equal to one and the numerator constant is pick, uh, carefully, I'll get the best possible rate of log k over k. And this log k again is due to the Markov chain uh, mixing. If I had IID noise without any Markov chain, then uh, I'll just have one over k. Uh, so the results are new. But the qualitative statements about these results, about the ball, the one over k, the one over k power psi, all these qualitative statements are actually very similar to the results in optimization. Uh, in fact, uh, oh, sorry. In the next slide, I'm going to talk about related work where I'll place this result in the context of other results uh, uh, for stochastic approximation. Before that, uh, the C6 has the initial condition sitting in it. And in the case of infinity norm, the C2 has a one minus gamma over two, and there is a logarithmic dependence in dimension. Questions? Uh, can you just go back to the bound in a sense? Um, uh, so if you want to convert this to a sample complexity type result. One over epsilon, one over epsilon log, uh, log something, log one over epsilon. No, but what is the dependence on the discount factor? Um, um, actually, if you hold on, I have all this discussion in the case of reinforcement learning. 
they're everything. Okay, sure. Here it's just a contraction factor. There the discount factor shows up. Okay, thanks. Cool. So before going into reinforcement learning, quick note about related work. If the contraction is a two norm contraction, then this is pretty much uh, very similar to uh, stochastic gradient descent. And there is a huge line of work. I didn't, obviously this is not at all exhaustive. I just uh, uh, cited a survey paper here. And suppose it's infinity norm contraction, the hard case, but um, uh, oh, by the way, and also in optimization, they do synchronous update, which means they are updating all the components. So if you do uh, infinity norm contraction and asynchronous, uh, in the case of Q learning, this was studied by Beck and Srikanth in uh, 2012 and 13. Uh, but their result is applicable only for Q-learning. They use ex other properties of Q-learning uh, uh, to get these results, whereas our result is very, very general. Also, the dependence on the dimension is polynomial, with the, uh, whereas ours is logarithmic. Then uh, if you look at Markovian stochastic approximation, but the operator is not a contraction, but it's linear and Hurwitz, then in the context of TD learning, uh, this was studied by Srikanth and Ng, uh, lace paper from two years ago. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the key ingredients of our proof actually comes from that paper. I'll uh, talk about it when I get to the proof. And uh, finally, our result is, uh, it looks at Markovian stochastic approximation, any norm contraction, uh, linear and Hurwitz actually fall into a special case of this. And it recovers all these results. It can be used for SGD, Q learning, TD learning, V trace, everything. And our result recovers all prior results. And we get uh, like tie, uh, like we improve on the bonds on this and we reproduce the bonds of Batu and Shikanti. Hey, Seva, if I could ask yeah. a quick question. So there are some results uh, result from uh, Yushin's group and also Adam's group. Uh, the yes, that uh, I'll talk about it at the end because uh, um, I cited that in the context of uh, Q learning because okay. their work is on Q learning. Okay, sure, thank you. Maybe I should have cited Adam's work here because that is stochastic approximation, but Yushin's work is only for Q learning, not stochastic approximation. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I just want to see like in-term bounds. Like what... Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I have all of that coming up. Okay, cool. Hope Thank we you. don't run out of time. I'm pretty bad with time. Okay, the key idea is that we have a new Lyapunov function. Okay, so let me show how this works in reinforcement learning. So Q learning, so we already talked about how Q learning looks like. This is the update equation for Q learning. And um, it, uh, uh, it turns out that the corresponding F bar is an L infinity norm contraction. I already told you this. Then if I just plug, uh, plug Q learning into our result, uh, I can get results for all steps as constant, one over K power psi, everything. I'm just showing one case. I didn't see a point of repeating it again and again. So it looks like this. Q star is the optimal uh, Q function. QK is my current thing. I'm looking at the mean square error with the same infinity norm. It's of this form, some constant times log K over K. Uh, same rate as before. Then the, the question is, how does this depend on the state action space uh, size? Uh, so this constant has the initial condition sitting in it. So the dependence on the state action pairs is logarithmic. This, this is where the log D comes in. But there is a caveat. There's another term in the denominator called kappa min. What is this kappa min? So remember, how do we collect samples for Q-learning? I have a policy pi, and then I'm just running this policy, right? So if you take an MDP and then fix a policy, what you get is Markov chain. So look at the stationary distribution of the Markov chain. So I have a stationary distribution on SA space and kappa min is the minimum probability of this distribution. We know that the minimum is not zero because it's ergodic Markov chain, but whatever the minimum is that shows up, which means in the best case, if my stationary distribution is uniform, then my dependence on the state action pair is, uh, is SA cube times log SA. Um, yeah, so when you talk about related work, I'll compare this with uh, other work. And uh, to answer Vijay's question, the beta is the discount factor here. The dependence on beta that we have is one minus beta cube. Um, uh, some papers claim this as one minus beta power five because there is a Q star sitting in this constant and Q star itself can be bounded by one, min one over one minus beta. So some people add this two and three and call it five, but uh, this is what it is. Any questions on this? Yeah, no, uh, that's partly what where I was asking because this is uh, the min max bond will have a one minus beta to the three, and this is and those you'll only come in with variance reduction methods. And this doesn't this vanilla Q learning does not have any variance reduction. Correct, correct, correct. This is not meeting the min max. This is mm. in Weinreich would call this five. Weinreich has a paper where he does variance reduction and changes the five, uh, decreases the five to four. He's mm -hmm. adding this two to three and calls it five. So yeah. the, which, this, is the right, which is the right estimate, I think, in some sense, right? Yeah. Sorry? 
which is the correct way to do it with the, the discount factor correct discount. correct yeah. correct correct yeah yeah uh yeah 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 i think it's believed that q learning cannot get the lower bound you have to do variance reduction or something else to get the lower bound there's no proof that is a belief yeah but i think in in any other algorithm also it has to have variance reduction even the one that uh, lin yang and others have even which is not q learning based that also has uh, variance reduction there's no way to meet the i see um, i see i see yeah there is some new stuff by sham kakade and others which is okay. using model based but even that i think implicitly has a variance reduction somewhere i see i see i see i see got it okay Okay, I think I'm doing pretty terribly with time, so I'm going to skip all the TD results and uh, directly go to the related work so that I have some time to talk about the proof. So maybe I'll just give you the punchline of TD results. So in TD, uh, we basically prove that uh, you can beat Monte Carlo. That stochastic approximation is better than Monte Carlo. We prove it. Uh, we get finite time bounds for what is called as n-step TD and TD lambda, which are uh, variants of TD algorithm. And for certain parameters of n and lambda, you'll get Monte Carlo. And for other parameters, you'll get like a spectrum of TD algorithms. And it has been known empirically that uh, this TD algorithms better, uh, better perform better than Monte Carlo. So our finite time bound justifies why that. happens but because i'm running out of time i'm going to skip all of that and um, i'll go to related work that lay asked about so firstly in terms of uh, q learning under constant step size were studied by beck and shrikant um, but uh, they have a worse dependence on the state action space uh, size we improve it by a factor of 2 and this con under constant step size high probability bounds were uh, uh, studied by yushin chen's group this is what lay asked about and uh, there even we have mean square bounds they have high probability bounds but uh, the dependence on uh, time and also state action space is pretty much the same i think we have we improved by, by some square root of log sa but otherwise the polynomial dependence is the same i'm not quite sure about the 1 over 1 minus beta i believe is the same i'm not 100% sure though and diminishing step sizes high probability bounds were studied in uh, uh, a paper from almost 20 years ago ivan dar et al and chu and weman in uh, 2020 chu and weman's paper is actually already subsumed by li et al because they already improved the uh, state action dependence from chu and weman okay so i didn't talk about td so i can skip that part and then i'll go to the proof sketch any questions before i talk about the proof okay cool so i'm just showing the main stochastic approximation result again i'm going to only going to talk about the uh, proof of stochastic approximation because the reinforcement learning results follow from direct application um even though they need little work uh, so so i'm trying to solve an equation of this form f bar of x equal to x where f bar is an expectation of f of x comma y where y is this markov chain and the stochastic approximation i am looking at is something like this and these are the assumptions i have the contraction property uh ergodicity and geometric mixing of the markov chain and uh, iid and uh, bounded noise of uh, bounded noise uh so a popular approach to look at stochastic approximation which is quite classical is by looking at the ode so what i did here is i took the stochastic approximation sent this xk on to the left sent epsilon k on to the left and then wrote it like this now if you squint your eyes and wave your hands you can pretend that the left hand side is kind of like a derivative and then on the right hand side because i'm squinting my eyes and waving my hands i'll drop the noise i write this minus x and then for this uh, markov chain i just simply replace it by f bar so i think of this as the corresponding ode why is this justified i don't have to justify i'm just thinking of it that's all but in reality the connection between this can be made very very formal we don't take that approach that's called the ode method this is the classical approach that was used to show asymptotic convergence but i want finite time bounds so what was showed by borker Uh, a while ago is that if you can show that this ode converges um, has global asymptotic stability which means no matter where you start it converges to x star if you can show that then he has a big theorem which says that the stochastic approximation also has the same property under appropriate choice of the step sizes but uh, we want to get finite time uh, bounds so we want something stronger than that uh, so before getting into what we do let me first uh, discuss about how do you show this global asymptotic stability 
So there is standard Lyapunov techniques from control theory. And in the case of, let's say that the contraction is with respect to infinity norm, just for concreteness. Like I said, it works for any norm. So you have to find a Lyapunov function and Borker pretty much showed that uh, infinity norm square works as a Lyapunov function. And using this as a Lyapunov function, you can show that it's drift, it's derivative can be bounded by this, uh, uh, bounded in this form. Then if you solve this ODE, you'll get that M is less than or equal to E power minus gamma T, which means M is going to zero. So which means X is going to X star. Um, what we want is, like I said, I don't use a ODE method. We want finite time error bounds on the original stochastic approximation. But what we do though, is we, uh, we use this intuition of this Lyapunov function. So the main challenge is that there are a lot of errors that I squinted my eyes and waved my hands. In particular, on the left-hand side, instead of having the derivative, I have this difference. So this is called the discretization error. On the right-hand side, so what I did is I took the stochastic approximation, I added and subtracted F bar. So if you cancel F bar, you get the original stochastic approximation. So now if I group the first two terms together, this is exactly the ODE term, I'm happy. That's why it's in green. Then if I look at this F minus F bar, this is like the Markovian error. This is the error because I'm sampling from this Markov chain and not using the steady state expectation. And finally, I have an additive noise error term. So I have to handle all these three noises. And this epsilon k step size is actually a good guy because if I make this smaller, then I'm making my error smaller. So that's the reason we use diminishing step size. So this epsilon k will let me control these noise terms. Okay, so now my challenge is, if I just had the ODE, I know how to handle, I basically can solve this, uh, this Lyapunov thingy. But uh, now I have to find a way of handling all these three error terms. And um, if we think about it intuitively, what's happening is the following. So I told you that M serves as a Lyapunov function for this ODE. What's happening is that suppose you think of this M as M is a convex function in this case, then what this ODE is doing is it's basically doing a gradient descent in continuous time along this, a gradient flow. And the stochastic approximation is trying to emulate that. It wants to do what the ODE is doing, but it's not quite good at it. It's uh, in each time as a time step, it's uh, introducing several errors, all these three errors that are pointed out. So it's kind of trying to follow this blue line, but it's like, uh, uh, it's jumping around and hopefully it's not too far. So I want to show that these errors that we are introducing in every time step don't matter too much. And one way to do that is if my function M, my objective function in this optimization viewpoint or the Lyapunov function for the ODE, if it happens to be smooth, then these errors can be handled. Why? What is smoothness? Smoothness, the, uh, the multiple equivalent definitions of smoothness, one of them looks like this. Uh, it just says that the difference between M of Y and M of X can be bounded by this first order term. You can basically do a Taylor series expansion for M. What this says is that the second order, the second derivative, the Hessian is bounded by a constant L. That's, uh, uh, that's one way of thinking about smoothness. So what this is saying is that if there are errors, those errors can be captured by this second order uh, uh, bound. So smoothness is very nice. Or even intuitively speaking, if this function is smooth and I'm jumping around, the smoothness will make sure that the errors are not too bad. Okay, very good. Then uh, we know that in the infinity norm contraction case, the Lyapunov function for the ODE is infinity norm square, right? So the question is, is this smooth? If this is smooth, we're done, uh, pretty much. But the answer is no. The main challenge is that this infinity norm square is not smooth. If you were working with two norm contraction, the ODE Lyapunov function would have been two norm square, but two norm square is smooth. That's the reason SGD literature is, uh, SGD analysis is easy, easier than the problem we are trying to solve. The non-smoothness of this Lyapunov function actually uh, makes the analysis challenging. Hey Siva, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So uh, in this case, the F bar, you're saying the F bar is not smooth? F bar is- No, not F bar. The mm -hmm. Lyapunov function is not smooth. Yeah, so in terms of F bar, is that F bar differentiable? F bar differentiable, I'm not sure. So it's, it's, Lipschitz. it's Lipschitz, so it's, I mean, it's almost. Yeah, yeah, F bar is Lipschitz. So... Almost F differentiable, but not quite. But you're not sure it's differentiable everywhere. Yeah, I don't remember the answer to that question. 
Okay, that's why, fine. Why yeah, you, we can talk about. Why do you uh, ask about differentiability of f bar? Yeah, I'm thinking about the Stan's methods, which require f oh, differentiable and the uh, okay. derivative to be okay. differentials. So that's okay. why I'm asking the question. Right? Maybe we can talk about it offline. I'm yeah, we can talk about that offline. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but m is the Lyapunov function, so I think we should worry about differentiability of m. Uh, I mean, in the case if f is differentiable and derivative is Lipschitz, then you don't need to expressly construct a Lyapunov function, right? Oh, use, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Then you don't, yeah. But I yeah. guess we, in fact, that's what we were thinking. Initially, we were trying to just find an implicitly Lyapunov function. Later, we figured out that we can explicitly construct it. Right, okay, okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, good. So now this Lyapunov function from the ODE does not work. Then what do we do? Then what I want to do is I want to construct a new Lyapunov function. Now my M is not X infinity square. It is some new thing that I construct. I'll construct it to be smooth. The second thing I'll want is that it is kind of close to X infinity square. Because I know that x infinity square is the right Lyapunov function for the ODE. Now, since I'm going to do a new thing, I will make sure it is well approximated by x infinity square. And furthermore, it is smooth. If I am able to find such a Lyapunov function, I haven't showed you what the, that function is, or I haven't even shown you that it exists, then it can be shown that uh, it is fairly easy to show using these two properties that uh, the stochastic approximation can be written uh, using the stochastic approximation, I can write a recursion on this M guy. So if you recall, the ODE we had before is very similar to this. Instead of the derivative, I have the difference. Instead of minus something M, I have minus something M, plus I have this little of term, little o terms. If I didn't have the little o terms, I could have gotten geometric convergence. This little o terms will ensure that I don't have geometric convergence. In stochastic case, we will not uh, get geometric convergence. One over K is the best we can do. Okay, good. So we are almost there. I need to tell you two things. One is what is this magical Lyapunov function? And then two is uh, um, uh, so even if I have the smoothness and approximation, I need some way of handling all the three errors. If the three errors are bounded in some reasonable manner, this will uh, take care of the rest. I need to make sure all the three errors can be bounded. This is what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides. And I'm going to conclude soon. Okay, so the question is, how do I find a Lyapunov function that satisfies these two properties? The answer is very simple. I take infinity norm square, and then I want smoothness, so I'll smooth it out. So there is this operation called infimal convolution. If I take a convex function, and then apply this infimal convolution with respect to any smooth convex function, what I get will be a smooth convex function. This is well known. And what is this infimal convolution? It's uh, 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 it looks like this. It's min of these two guys with a plus in between. If I remove min and put an integral, if I remove plus and put a multiplication, that's convolution. So that's the reason this is called infimal convolution. And uh, this also has a relation to Fenchel duality, legendary transforms and so on. I'll not get into that. In particular, uh, if the smooth function I use happens to be two norm square, I can use any smooth function that I want. Uh, what we do is we optimize over all possible smooth functions to get the best dependence on dimension. If I use two norm square as the smoothing function, I'll get one over k convergence rate, but the dimensionality dependence will be poor. But by optimizing our all possible functions, we get uh, we get the best dimensionality dependence as well. Uh, in the special case when this g is two norm square, that's called the Moro envelope. What we have is called the more generalized Moro envelope. Okay. Now that we know the Lyapunov function, in the next slide I'll show how to handle the uh, error terms. So I told you that three error terms. Uh, the the uh, due to smoothness, it's okay if I bound them in some way in terms of x. And then the additive error by assumption is bounded by x. So that's the easiest to handle in some sense. And the discretization error, I don't really have to do much. It uh, smoothness kind of takes care of it. Then the only thing I have to worry about is this Markovian error. The fact that I uh, am sampling from this Markov chain instead of using its expectation. So, uh, so, so for this, we use a trick. Essentially, it turns out that uh, eventually when I have to get the mean square error, I'm interested in the expectation of this quantity, not this quantity itself. Then what I can do is I can use tower property of expectation and then condition on time k minus tau. Uh, there should be another expectation here. This is tower property. This is a typo. This is a second expectation here. So using tower property, I can condition on k minus tau. Now, if I condition on k minus tau, this guy is as if it's on in steady state. What is tau? Tau is the mixing time of this markup chain. So it's as if this guy is very close to the stationary distribution. Therefore, this expectation should be close to f bar, and then we are done. 
so this trick uh, 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 so this is where i'm explo uh, exploiting the fast mixing of the markov chain and this trick was used in the case of linear stochastic approximation by shrikant and ying we adapted from there but a uh, rudimentary form of this idea was present in a proof in bertsikas and sitsikalas neurodynamic programming book okay so to conclude uh, i talked about finite time convergence bounds of general markovian stochastic approximation so so one quick thing shiva before you get there uh, so there all you need is basically uh, so you use the fact that f is bounded in some sense right so then that's all you need to we need f is bounded but uh, i mean this step does not no, no, wait, that's all you need i mean that's fine for finite spaces okay but i mean uh, you why was not why yeah, was not uh, if if y was not uh, finite space is more like countable space you still need f to be bounded because it's, you're using to you're using the fact that you're closing so, total so i think i should clarify my x is always finite uh, dimensional vector yeah no but that y is not right so y need not be is what you claim so then you still need my, because you're using total variation you'll still need uh, so total variation is equivalent in variational in equal variational sense to uh, bounded functions being closed Mm -hmm. right, so you need basically you need bounded functions yeah bounded uh, continuous but like i said closed. we already assume that f bar is bounded so we don't have a problem yeah yeah that's fine not just f bar i think in f also as a function you need to be con uh, bounded i think yeah. <laughs> oh i see i i don't remember if we assume f is bounded or not i don't know i'm not sure if no 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 we, we don't assume it's bounded both f and f bar it, it doesn't have to be bounded but uh But you will need that if you're going to use uh, basically your variation I mean, total variation. These just measures are closed, and then you're going to say that to map back from total variation to say that the functional values are closed. Then you'll need bounded functions, right? So because uh, that's where the duality is. The duality result is for total variation. You can compare to bounded. Uh, you have to compare it to bounded continuous functions. But uh, Siva, so x here is not necessarily bounded, right? So if x, x is, is not, not yeah, then f cannot be bounded, right? Sorry, why are we worrying about boundedness? Yeah, I don't know. But I'm just. <laughs> well, I'm just saying from your argument, I'm just trying to see, understand how you can you, you'd have mixing, but mixing is here for the Markov chain is given in terms of total variation now. I think the mixing the in term y, not in term x, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. But yeah. you're comparing the distribution. X is fixed. X is frozen in some sense, right? In some sense, yeah. And then you're saying, I want to look at this Markov chain, and I look at uh, the values it could have obtained. I know the measure on y k is now given by the. It's close to the stationary distribution, but it's close in total variation now. Correct. And then I basically appeal to the duality and say, hey, I, I can go back to the. This is the Cantor which um, uh, duality, and say hey, I may as well look at functions and then compare them, right? Right, and those functions have to have a certain property. The duality doesn't work for all functions. Right. So I don't remember the exact details. I mean, we do you we do work with total variation distance. I so can't. You have to have the bound, and the bound has to be less than equal to one. I mean, that's basically where the duality works. So I think you may have some right. conditions, but, but maybe uh, you have it in your results. We don't have a problem as long as we are using it for uh, reinforcement learning. In all reinforcement learning applications, all these are bounded. Yk okay. is count. Yk is finite. A finite dimension. Finite uh, state space. Xk is also finite dimensional. Yeah. So by definition, it is it is bounded. Well, yeah, so when you go to the countable thing, you have to be careful. Yeah. X K is finite dimensional because uh, I'm in finite state action spaces. No, X is a Q value, right? The Q value is Q, Q, X is not bounded, but X is in finite dimensional space. Right, right. But X is a take is a real number, right? Is a real vector. It's a real vector, correct? X is an R. But it is bounded though, right? Because you have uh, your no starting... X cannot be no. Bounded. It's not bounded. X is not bounded. Why? Because you have a starting point, and then you use the Q star as bounded, and the starting point is also bounded. So part, that's right? the thing for Q learning; it is bounded. Q learning, you can show the iterates are bounded. So yeah. there are many other applications I skipped in off-policy reinforcement learning. There is no known result that the corresponding uh, V function is bounded. Okay. That's yeah. one of the reasons why we had to develop this uh, method. That's why we couldn't use the existing uh, proof techniques from Q learning. All right. No thanks. Sorry, I went for a long, I went for a longer detail okay. then. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sorry. This is a very long paper with lot of technical details. So I'm trying to just distill and present the key ideas. 
so the proof is like several pages long fixing all these uh, all these issues so yeah so i don't remember the exact detail about uh, f being bounded we can take it offline okay to conclude i presented finite time convergence of markovian stochastic approximation uh, we did this in the case of uh, uh, when the contraction is an arbitrary norm and we did this using a new lyapunov function and using this we obtained finite sample bounds for reinforcement learning algorithms i presented the result for q learning and then i skipped uh, all the other variants of td uh, i think i'll just stop there i don't have time to talk about other things so i'll conclude there and then i guess lay is going to present yeah so lay will take over now so if you okay. just want to stop sharing screen okay. then he will uh, yeah he can okay uh, give me one second Okay. Can you see my slide? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. So first, uh, Siva, thank you very much for this uh, very exciting talk. Uh, it's a very nice work. I really liked it. Uh, so the contribution here, I summarize them uh, in uh, three brief points. First is uh, it generalizes the. Uh, Moron's envelope for constructing the, you develop a generalized Moron envelope for constructing the Lyapunov function. Uh, when the Lyapunov function is not smooth, or it helps to smooth the Lyapunov function, so you can use the uh, Lyapunov drift analysis. Uh, second is uh, uh, with your method, you establish a unified framework, which can be used to analyze finite sample, finite time bounds, both with a constant linear rate and uh, time varying linear rate. And uh, finally, uh, from your result, we can see there's a very clear trade-off between the bias and the variance, which capture uh, some key ingredients of the reinforcement learning algorithm. I think this is also very, very interesting. So I, have a, uh, I here have a, just a few uh, quick questions. So our first question is uh, in uh, Srikan and uh, my work about TD learning. Uh, beyond the mean square error, we also develop higher moments. Uh, I feel like the same thing can be done in the, this analysis as well. Like, have you thought about or uh, extend uh, that result to higher moments instead of mean square error, like a fourth moment of the, like the error, six nice. moments error and so on? So mm -hmm. we haven't thought about it actually, um, but uh, thinking about it now, so, the notion of smoothness somehow captures quadratic property of the function. So to do to get higher moments, for example, you have to use a, a cubic and power four Lyapunov function, right? So mm -hmm. in the, the two norm case, the Lyapunov function would be x two uh, x two norm cube, x two norm power four, and so on. Then I'm not sure if smoothing is the right operation to do. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, so the uh, advantage of having a uh, higher moments is you can get a very strong concentration result instead of just the mean square. Error. Like you can say with a high probability, like all the Q function I learned will be very close to the optimal Q. Inst just not only just correct. in the mean square sense. Not only in the mean square sense, correct. Right, right. Correct, yeah. correct. Yes. Um, I guess uh, what you're trying to say is if you want tail bounds, I can use Markov inequality with mean square, but that will be pretty loose. If you have higher moments, then you'll get a tighter tail bounds. Right, right, right. And there's some interesting phenomena uh, we found is uh, if we use constant step size, then the higher moments exist for certain Correct. moments, but uh, it, it's infinite. They don't exist beyond. Right, right. right. Yes, so I some, remember that that's a right, very right. interesting observation. Yeah. Right. So yeah, this could be maybe uh, you can be something interesting to think about in the Q-learning setting. Yes. Uh, what yeah. do we, we may be able well, to I guess that would mean that you come up with a different, uh, I mean, you're here, you're just basically trying to approximate it with a, um, like a strongly convex function, right? Smooth function. Yeah, well, well basically you have a, yeah, a smooth function, yes, but I mean, basically the hex Hessian is bounded, and that's what you're looking at in some way, right? So, yeah. yeah. And so you may have to look at a more uh, stringent approximation which has other moment i mean other, other things other higher uh, derivatives being controlled as well exactly so we have to find a notion that is more general than smoothness hmm. smoothness somehow corresponds to the second order behavior we have to find it we have to generalize the notion of smoothness to, to third order behavior to get third moment for example yeah so you need to 
smooth definition for higher order. Yes. Sense. So here they are smoothly defined for the second order, I guess. Yes. But we have something else that's going on though. So this is not related to this work. This is another line of work, which is still ongoing. What we do there is we want to find the MGF or the characteristic function of the, so suppose you use constant step size, you have a distribution. So we want to study the distribution, uh, the whole distribution by looking at the characteristic function, but then actually finding the distribution explicitly is not possible. So we can look at an asymptotic limit of that, very similar to the heavy traffic analysis. So we have some partial results there. Yeah, but in that case, if the, uh, some moments are not exist, then the... So the thing is, even though the moments don't exist in the limit, all moments exist. Oh yeah. So we are only yeah, trying yeah, to right. the limit, so we're good. So it's not for the constant step size, it's you're letting the... No, no, no. Well, I think if you're looking at, at characteristic function, it should not matter though, right? I mean, they will that's the reason that. we are using characteristic function so that yeah, it doesn't matter. Moment, uh, it's not moment generating function. It's a not moment, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also on top that. of it, what we're doing is for every epsilon, there's a distribution. Now look at the sequence of this distribution as a function of epsilon, and then we want to find the limit. Right, right. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, I look forward to hear more about that work. Sure, that's what I do. <laughs> right. Uh, so the second question is, uh, uh, how about like if we use a function approximation? Uh, I think there are some recent work showing uh, q learning with function approximation using neural networks can uh, solve the problem exactly, you know, get the exact uh, q learning solution, even like in continuous state space, action space, if we use a neural network. What work is this? I think that Jason Lee's, one is the Jason Lee's work. Okay. Yeah. So Q learning with function approximation is known to diverge. Even in the linear function approximation case, it's known to diverge. Yeah, but there are some real results showing if your neural network is large enough, it's uh, like if, if the, like the uh, number of parameters scale appropriately with the dimension of the uh, space and the number of samples, then you can show the, uh, even with neural network approximation, you can solve the Q-learning problem. Is that right. because you can, it comes up with a neural tangent kernel in some sense? It comes Something up like clear. that. Yeah, yeah, I think the idea is it. if the neural network is large enough, it's more or less just a linear function approximation. It becomes a linear thing, right? Yeah, that's yeah. yeah but even linear divergence yeah. in Q-learning. Uh, not necessary diverge, right? So it's a diverge is there under- There are no counter examples. Yeah, there's no counter examples. The counter examples, I think, are, for example, if you use a TD learning, TD guaranteed to converge, right? So TD it depends on the, or the, how you use the samples. The, the sample you use have to be consistent, basically. So you cannot like, or, so the, the, sam the policy you are learning have to be the policy you are generating the samples. In that case, it will yeah, 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 yeah. So right. deadly triad, certain Bartu calls it says deadly triad. So the right, deadly right. triad is uh, off policy, bootstrapping, and uh, function approximation. Yeah, so, so I don't the think they are looking at the off policy setting, looking at yeah. on policy I setting. So, I, mean, I mean, they're learning the optimal function, optimal, uh, optimal, optimal Q value. Q so, so you are taking action based on the uh, whatever you have learned so far. Okay, so that is something we are thinking about in our group as well. I'm not familiar with uh, Jason Lee's work. I looked at some work in the neural network space, but I didn't really quite understand what the result is saying and what limit and so on. Uh, so we are focusing on linear function approximation. So we have a paper where we show that um, if a certain assumption is satisfied, if the discount factor is small enough, then Q learning with linear function approximation actually converges. Mm, and okay. we have a uh, rate of convergence on finite time. Bound. I see. So that or uh, Xiaomai have some work on, Xiaomai Sh has some work on. Uh, Sean Main's paper shows mm -hmm. asymptotic convergence. We established finite time guarantees. Okay, of, uh, cool. Based yeah. on similar assumptions. Yeah, I think three kinds of working on the problem I just mentioned. So he, he knows lots of- Right, I thought Srikant's work was on TD. TD for q learning, I think. TD for Q learning, what do you mean? Yeah. TD is policy evaluation, Q learning is control. You mean the control? Uh, people, like, I mean, we can talk about offline. So okay. uh, I think some people use TD for very general or okay. that general term, as long as you have the, like the uh, current reward plus uh, next Q value minus the uh, current Q value in any form, they call it TD, <laughs> call it TD, TD see, learning see. algorithm, yeah. So yeah, my uh, last question is related to, uh, I, I think the one question I have asked. So uh -huh. here you are smoothing the Lyapunov function. Right. And I think uh, for stochastic approximation, uh, if we know the differential equation is smooth, 
Right. And uh, uh-huh. there's uh, you, uh, you can apply the existing result. So I was wondering, instead of like smoothing f, can you smooth? Uh, sorry, smooth the Lyapunov function. Can you smooth f? Sorry, sorry. Suppose f is smooth, then what? So for example, you can use like integral Lyapunov function to take the integral of the, uh, wow. the matrix over time. So use that integral form as your Lyapunov function. And That's the ODE, like, right? Uh, from, from the, the ODE. But for the okay. stochastic approximation? Yeah, you can use that for your as a Lyapunov function for the Lyapunov drift analysis. I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay. So that's so, some idea like in the stance method, you have your ODE and uh, these, the integral of some performance metric over the trajectory of the uh, ODE serve mm-hmm. as the Lyapunov function. I see. But uh, the, it requires the differential equation, the F function to be differentiable and the derivative also have to be Lipschitz. I see. So, um, so this idea of smoothing uh, F in some sense is what is quite popular in optimization literature. So the idea there is if you want to optimize a non-smooth function, then look at its smooth approximation and do gradient descent on that because that has faster convergence. Then as time goes on, you can make this kind of uh, approximation error get smaller and smaller. So in fact, the whole, this whole thing about Mora envelope and so on, uh, this was developed in that literature. So I guess what we wanted to do was get a generic result without having to change the algorithm. Um, uh, and that's the reason we smoothed the uh, M instead of smoothing F. Right, right, right. So exactly, that's also uh, something I'm thinking like here, the reason why the M is not smooth is because uh, Q learning has that max inside, right? Correct. I, right. Correct. So, uh, can we smooth out that max? So, yeah. that... Uh, so, for example, instead of the max, you can do soft max, for example. Right, 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 right. Then I think that uh, it's not exactly the same, but I think it has connections to uh, policy gradient, natural policy gradient, and so on. Right, right, right. One right. way of thinking about natural policy gradient is to do the soft max instead of max. Right, right. So with softmax, I think there's a connection between Q learning and the policy gradient, nature policy gradient. Exactly. It has some occurrence there. Yeah. Exactly. But I think they, you lose some of the contraction properties, I think, in there. If you don't, you're not careful, that's one thing to be worried about. Going in policy the- gradient uh, worldview, they don't think about contraction property. They think of it in terms of uh, not even convexity. They think of it from optimization point of view. In optimization, there's no contraction, right? People use convexity, smoothness, and things like that. But yeah. here, there is no convexity either. But uh, the, instead of using contraction property of Bellman operator, there is something else called performance difference lemma. That is the main workhorse there. Yeah. So, so I think uh, like building upon Vijay's comment, in some sense, the classical MDP theory is all centered around Bellman equation and contraction property of the Bellman operator, right? I think the policy gradient worldview essentially says that that is just one way of thinking about it. There are these other ways of thinking about the Bellman operator, which are also useful. Maybe in classical MDP theory, that was not considered because by looking at contraction, you get geometric convergence. Whereas by looking at all these things, uh, at least as of now, there's no geometric convergence. Maybe there is a recent paper. I don't know if they do it. Uh, so, so that's why that was a better thing. But in reinforcement learning, I think this policy gradient worldview is also quite useful. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. So yeah. Any yeah. other Thanks. questions by anyone? Sorry, I wanted to open up the thing. If not, uh, Shiva, thank you again for a very nice talk. Yeah. And thank sometime you. this should be up on YouTube on the channel. So you should be able to, we were asking for a link of the talk. It will come up in a few days time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Bye.